Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, 
program. We'll watch a little bit more of the human footprint and see what our life's possessions are all about, all the things we accumulate in life. We haven't covered entertainment and clothes and all those kind of things. We're also going to discuss a section of Srimad Bhagavatam, a postgraduate study to Bhagavad Gita, the 11th canto. There is a particular Gita known as the Pingala Gita. And Pingala, she practiced what is often referred to in the news as the oldest profession. She was a night worker, as they say down under. Mm. So, she is considered by the Avaduta Brahmana to be one of his 24 gurus. And now, how can that be? <laughs> the Avaduta Brahmana is speaking to King Yadu, and he's telling him, all the realizations he's gotten by studying various parts of nature, as well as by studying the behavior of Pingala. Now, what could we learn by studying the profession? Studying someone who has the profession as Pingala does. Hmm. A night worker, more specifically known as a prostitute. Actually, the Avaduta Brahmana 
explains that there's so much we can learn, especially about how hopes for material happiness are the greatest destroyer of peace. We'll take a look at the first verse of chapter 8 of the 11th Canto. This verse summarizes what we were discussing yesterday, and then from there, we're going to move on. The saintly Brahmana said, O king, the embodied living entity automatically experiences unhappiness in heaven or hell. Similarly, happiness will also be experienced even without one seeking it. Therefore, a person of intelligent discrimination does not make any endeavor to obtain such material happiness. So I hope that some of you at least are convinced of this point. At least I know most of you are intrigued that I don't have to struggle for happiness. I'm going to get what I'm going to get. Instead, let me push for my self-realization, my spiritual advancement. <laughs> That's not prepackaged. That's all up to you completely. So remember the words of the Avadutta Brahmana. O king, the embodied living entity automatically experiences unhappiness in heaven or hell. You can look on this earth and you can see places that are heavenly or places that are hellish. What's the example of a heavenly place that you see on earth? Who can say? Huh? No, no, no. Material. <laughs> Suddenly you become so spiritual this weekend. Very nice. <laughs> the only thing of temples and <laughs> Buckingham Palace. Heavenly Buckingham Palace? <laughs> okay. That's your idea of a heavenly place. Huh? Anyone else? A heavenly place on earth. Switzerland? Switzerland. Why? Huh? You've been there? No, I'm. Uh, well, what makes you think Switzerland is like heaven? <laughs> It's where all the money is kept, huh? <laughs> and it's very organized and clean, right? <laughs> you used to be able to keep your money there without the government's knowing, but now it's changed, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Heaven on Earth. Gold Coast. Gold Coast. <laughs> How many of you have been to the Gold Coast? Raise your hand. So you felt like you were in heaven? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, <laughs> anywhere else? No, no materially heavenly place in India? Yeah, it's somewhere not. Huh? This one, this one's pilgrimage. No, no pilgrimage, material place. <laughs> but, 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 no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like materially also it's it's a good place. What's that? Uh, like it, people go there for pilgrimage, but materially also it's a really yeah, nice yeah, place. Yeah. Amarnath, it's it's in Jammu and Kashmir. Like not Are they always in there? <laughs> 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 Anyone else? Goa. Goa. Goa? Is that where all the foreigners go? <laughs> it's all Russian now, isn't it? <laughs> Dirty beaches. Yeah, the hippies on the beach and all sorts of things. Dirty beaches. Now, India is meant for spiritual paradise. <laughs> Vrindavan and Mayapur and Jagannathpur. It's very difficult for India to fake a material paradise. <laughs> it's the land of Dharma. <laughs> so why bother faking it? <laughs> Better just to present the spiritual world. <laughs> but what about Hawaii? Who's been to Hawaii? Oh, no. 
Shiva Prabhupada said himself that if there's one place on earth that's heaven, it's Hawaii. <laughs> well, the temperature stays year-round 28 degrees, and every afternoon a sea breeze blows with little droplets of moisture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a hellish place on earth. Huh? You have to. I cannot hear. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Pakistan. Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Afghanistan, Pakistan, anywhere else. Pakistan. Huh? Only Pakistan. Huh? Bombay, Bombay. 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 Miami. Huh? Miami. 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 Miami is hellish? You've been there? <laughs> <laughs> what about North Korea? Hmm. Hmm. That's what Americans China. <laughs> China. Communist. China's not communist, that's just a fake, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, the point that the other Dutta Brahman is making. The embodied living entity automatically experiences unhappiness in heaven or hell. Automatically unhappiness. Even in that so-called materially heavenly place, you can experience unhappiness, right? Maybe you can remember going on a vacation or visiting relatives and he thought it was going to be oh so nice and then some anxiety happens, some physical distress happens. So therefore, similarly, happiness will also be experienced even without one seeking it. Therefore, a person of intelligent discrimination, and we want you all to be persons of intelligent discrimination, does not make any endeavor to obtain such material happiness. So hopefully from this weekend, we'll motivate you to become a person of intelligent discrimination if you're not already that. Because the world needs such persons. Even more than the world needs IT persons, it needs persons of intelligent discrimination. It is the most valuable career. But what has captured our consciousness? Consumerism. So we're going to take a look at some more measurements of all the things we accumulate in our life. We want to free our identity from being a consumer. You know the mantra? Work, buy, consume, die. We want to free ourselves from that cycle. And that means we need to see clearly how we are taken on that role of a consumer. Although we call ourselves nice consumers, yes? Very respectable, cultured consumers. <laughs> but the bottom line is still the same. So after we see some more of all the things we accumulate in life, then we're going to go to the Pingala Gita, the song sung by this night worker, Pingala. Usually, who would want to hear such a thing? But she's going to, through her own experience, give words of wisdom that even the Avaduta Brahmana is going to quote to King Yadu. All right. All right. <laughs> So you see more information about your life as a consumer. <laughs> and unfortunately, many people look for their happiness in that way. 
respectfully in a cultured way, but still they look for their happiness in that way. Now, how about developing persons of discrimination, intelligent discrimination? This is what's going to make a difference in your life, in your family's life, and in the world. If you can develop intelligent discrimination to not be caught up in all this madness, to not identify with consumption as a status symbol, a sign of success, that you are a good person. So, of course, as we said yesterday, we're not suggesting that you live under a tree and have no car. We're talking about simple living and high thinking instead of high living and no thinking. <laughs> I don't think anyone here watches TV four hours a day, right? What was the lifetime total? 12 years out of 77 simply absorbed in TV. 12 years, round the clock, that's the total. So what are you going to do with your life and what kind of life do you want for your children? Who do they... Who do you think you are and who should your children think they are? What is your goal in life? What will you tell them? Just be nice consumers. Be respectable consumers. <laughs> and I always ask the question, what do you think your children will say to you? Be nice consumers? We just want to do what everyone else around us is doing. And then what are you going to say? No, 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 you shouldn't do like that. Your grandmother was not like that. And what are your children going to say? They're not going to care. So unless you can give them higher knowledge so that they can have intelligent discrimination, you'll fail as your you'll fail in your duty as a parent, as an educator. What are you going to pass on to them? First of all, you have to have something yourself. What is the higher principle that you can pass on to them? Just study hard, get a good job, consume, that's it. Respect your relatives, that's all. <laughs> Don't worry about who you are. Don't worry about what is your purpose of life. Just do all the things that are external and people will respect you. <laughs> is that all you can tell them? <laughs> so we spoke about the Pingala Gita. This song, this Gita, shows how so much distress comes from hoping for material happiness. Let's go to text 22. We have the verses beyond that also go over there? No, it's just the text. Uh, okay. I'll read the Sanskrit. Pingala namabhishya seed Videha nagare pura tasya me shikshitam kinchin nibodha nirpanandana. O son of kings, previously in the city of Videha there dwelled a prostitute named Pingala. Now please hear what I have learned from that lady. Interesting, yes? What can you learn from? Someone practicing such a profession. But someone with intelligent discrimination can learn from everything. And this is the cutting edge that bhakti gives you. You can see all around you lessons for how to make advancement in your spiritual life and resist the material illusion. Every day is a learning experience. Every day offers a treasure of knowledge. Not simply knowledge of the ordinary, but knowledge of the material and spiritual world and what is your real home. So we're going to listen to what the Avaduta Brahmana learned from Pingala the prostitute. The lesson is so important that this section of the Bhagavatam is called the Pingala Gita. 
All right, I'll have to read because we don't have the verses ready for the screen. <clears throat> Please listen carefully, and we'll discuss as we go along. Once that prostitute, desiring to bring a lover into her house, stood outside in the doorway at night, showing her beautiful form. Now, of course, everyone here would say that they would never do such a thing, either present oneself as she's doing, or be a customer of her. But let's look at the general implications of Pingala. She's standing outside in the doorway at night showing her beautiful form. In other words, she's trying to get things in this world by using what she has, using her talents, her skills, her experience. Isn't that what the world requires of you? <laughs> when you go for a job interview, they want to know your talents, your skills, your experience. So Pingala is showing you this is how material existences live. She's got particular talents and skills. And she's interacting with the world for the purpose of increasing her power. Getting what she wants. So let us not push aside Pingala and say, oh, what a horrible person. We are very respectable. We are very cultured. Now let's look and see how the underlying principle could be there in our life also. As we try to make our way through the world. That's all she's trying to do. Of course, she's doing it in a particular way. But nevertheless, in general, you can see she's trying to get things. She has hopes. She wants happiness. She has a particular occupation. Everyone has an occupation. And the purpose of the occupation is to get things. Not to simply survive. None of you are working just to survive. <laughs> You're working because you have higher hopes than that. You want comfort, luxury, lasting security. And so does Pingala. So you may have IT skills, you may have banking skills, biotech skills. And what does Pingala have? Rupam Uttamam, the most beautiful form. So she simply engaged in the marketplace. In Australia, yes, such business is legal, isn't it? When conducted a certain way. So she has her occupation. Oh, best among men. This prostitute was very anxious to get money. And as she stood on the street at night, oh, we had it. She studied all the men who were passing by, thinking, Oh, this one surely has money. I know he can pay the price, and I'm sure he would enjoy my company very much. Thus, she thought about all the men on the street. Horrible, yes? But, how are we also practicing this mentality? We are studying our material situation. Oh, I can get money like this. I can get more money like that. I know this employer will pay the price I want. <laughs> I'm sure this corporation will enjoy my talents very much and reward me handsomely. Yes. <laughs> you see? <laughs> well, let me go to the university to prepare to display my beautiful form my CD. <laughs> <laughs> so Pingala, she's dangling her form in front of all the men on the street, hoping to attract business, and we dangle our CD, you know? <laughs> so, she's calculating. This one surely has money. This one I'm sure would like to be with me. So that's what material life does to us. We're always calculating how we can get what we want from this situation or that situation. Because we want to consume and enjoy. So we're always making these calculations. 
We have the next. As the prostitute Pingala stood in the doorway, many men came and went, walking by her house. Her only means of sustenance was prostitution, and therefore she anxiously thought, maybe this one who is coming now is very rich. Oh, he is not stopping, but I'm sure someone else will come. Surely this man who's coming now will want to pay me for my love, and he will probably give lots of money. Thus, with vain hope, she remained leaning against the doorway, unable to finish her business and go to sleep. Out of anxiety, she would sometimes walk out toward the street, and sometimes she went back into her house. In this way, the midnight hour gradually arrived. So, she's actually, she actually likes her career, and she thinks it's giving her popularity, surely there'll be some man who wants to pay me. And she's actually seeing it as a way to feel wanted. Not simply the money, but she also wants to feel wanted and appreciated. She wants to be famous. Surely there'll be some men out there who will realize I am highly sought after. I'm a valuable commodity. Psychologists at the workplace have pointed out that actually people don't simply work for the money. More than the money, it's the appreciation and respect at the workplace that the employees most value. You want to feel like you've done a good job, that you're known as a highly efficient person who can get the job done, that's why corporations and businesses have an HR department. The, the job of the HR department is to figure out how to pay you with things other than money. <laughs> how to give you respect, how to give you a plaque at the end of the year, <laughs> how to give you fame in the, in the company newspaper. So my mother, she called me a few days ago. She tried to call me and she left an email. Don't you know your youngest brother is, he has the front page article in the auto news, automobile industry newspaper uh, in the USA. He's on the front page. Uh, uh, do you know what the headline says? It says, top Toyota lawyer refuses to settle court cases outside of court. Uh, he's made the front page of the auto news. <laughs> She was happy. He's getting fame. Yes. <laughs> he's on the board of Toyota. He's the general counsel. And now he's on the front page of Auto News saying, we don't settle court cases outside. We go through the legal process. We want to win. Uh, so everyone wants some appreciation. It's just the Auto News. It's not the newspaper for everyone. You know, it's in industry newspapers. But still, fame in your profession means so much. Distinction, adoration. I am the tops in my field. I am the tops at my bank. I am the tops in my company. They know when they want the job done, they come to me. You'll even work overtime without pay just to get that prestige. You want to be known. You want to be valued. So Pingala's doing the same thing. <laughs> Surely this man who's coming now will want to pay me for my love. And he'll probably give lots of money. <laughs> In this way, with vain hope, she remained leaning against the doorway, unable to finish her business and go to sleep. Similarly, so often, we're working so hard, we're unable to go to sleep. We're unable to finish our business and come home to our families. And we're also in anxiety, walking this way, that way, oh, what to do, what to do. Next. As the night wore on, the prostitute, who intensely desired money, gradually became morose, and her face dried up. Thus, being filled with anxiety for money, 
and most disappointed, she began to feel a great detachment from her situation, and happiness arose in her mind. Mm. There's a change happening. She's tired of being so distressed and morose, filled with material desires. She's tired of longing for that happiness. Some or other within her, she's starting to feel detached. Like, what's the point of all this? Many of you may have come this weekend looking for such an experience. You want to feel detachment from the rat race. You want some natural, real happiness to arise in your mind. So this night, Pingala was getting no customers. But gradually, she became indifferent. Gradually, she became detached from her situation. Now, actually, there's a reason why that happened. We'll explain later. But sometimes, in your own situation, you get so exhausted that you just detach yourself from it. Oh, whatever. What happens, happens. Uh, <laughs> I cannot become so absorbed in this. I've had enough. In that mood, if you're fortunate to know devotees, you can get the key to spiritual advancement. But if you're not fortunate, what do you do when you become exhausted and tired and that's enough, I've had it, I, I don't care anymore? If you're unfortunate, you do like most people, you go get intoxicated. Where are my friends? Let's go to the pub. The prostitute felt disgusted with her material situation and thus became indifferent to it. Indeed, detachment acts like a sword, cutting to pieces the binding network of material hopes and desires. Now please hear from me the song sung by the prostitute in that situation. How is it that this mood or this mentality came upon Pingala? She felt disgusted with her material situation and she wasn't attached anymore. She wasn't so bound to her cravings. The reason is that she had had some association with Vaishnavas. Some or other, some Vaishnavas, the Acharyas explained, had come by her door as they went through the neighborhood giving spirits enlightenment. And so she had listened a little bit. And so therefore, because of that association with devotee, when she became frustrated, she remembered those instructions and therefore she started to feel indifferent to material life. Now what would you say about her indifference? Not good, huh? She should keep her ambitions, yes? cannot have career indifference, right? In one sense, that's true. The way a devotee approaches career is, as I said yesterday, I'm going to work, I'm pushing on my career in order so I can give to myself and others. Not to get for me. Not to get consumer things. 12 cars in a lifetime. 15 computers in a lifetime. I'm going to work, I'm pushing on my career so that I can give a spiritual lifestyle to myself, to my family, and to as much of the world as my resources allow. If you are very wealthy, then you can enable, you can facilitate so many persons becoming Krishna conscious. Or, if you're not extremely wealthy, maybe just um, a few persons outside of your family you can help facilitate their bhakti. So you go to work in order to give, not to get more for me, more for my loved ones. More what? <laughs> the person of intelligent discrimination wants to give the greatest jewels. So 
The indifference of a devotee to the material world is not laziness. It's an endeavor with full enthusiasm, but letting Krishna enjoy the results. Let Krishna have the fruits. And that way the devotee can go to work, can go to school. But all those activities are for the purpose of supporting a spiritual lifestyle. And obviously you don't want to work night and day because then you'll have no time for your spiritual life. You, in other words, Krishna is not recommending you work night and day and say, it's all for you, Krishna. <laughs> because you'll destroy yourself in that way. Keep the work devotional balance. You work in order to live. Don't live for work. Your real career is your spiritual development, your Krishna consciousness. So now the sword of detachment is cutting the karmic burdens of Pingala, her material hopes and desires. Are you ready to hear the Pingala Gita, the song that she sang? Very well. Very well. <laughs> Okay. Nahyanga jata nirvedo deha bandam jahasati yata vigana rahito manuja mamatam nirva. Still, this is the Avaduta Brahmana talking, introducing the song. O oh, king, just as a human being who is bereft of spiritual knowledge never desires to give up his false sense of proprietorship over many material things, similarly, a person who has not developed detachment never desires to give up the bondage of the material body. So we saw all the things in the documentary that you can have a sense of proprietorship over. Someone would say, why give that up? These are the things that are part of life. But you see, it's not that the devotee has no possessions at home. It's just that the devotee recognizes, let me get what I need in order to live a spiritual life. So that, with that mentality, you live easily within your means. Pingala Vacha Home Mohavitatim Pashyata Vijatatmana Yakanta Asata Kamam Kama Yena Balisha. Now this is Pingala speaking. This is the start of the Pingala Gita. The prostitute Pingala said, Just see how greatly illusioned I am, because I cannot control my mind. Just like a fool, I desire lusty pleasure from an insignificant man. You see, even though it was her occupation to be a prostitute, she was, in her mind, imagining this is, this is how popular she is. This is how wanted she is. This is how sought after she is. This is what the mind does. It imagines a sense of false importance for ourselves. Whether you are Pingala, or PhD, or whatever. <laughs> you want to be desired, appreciated, respected, distinctive. You want distinction. Does everyone see that I'm different and I have a special characteristic? Does everyone notice that? Next. I am such a fool that I have given up the service of that person who being eternally situated within my heart is actually most dear to me. That most dear one is the Lord of the universe who is the bestower of real love and happiness and the source of all prosperity. Although he is in my own heart, 
I have completely neglected him. Instead, I have ignorantly served insignificant men who can never satisfy my real desires and who have simply brought me unhappiness, fear, anxiety, lamentation, and illusion. So this is the life story of a conditioned soul, neglecting the Lord in the heart. And we're serving so many foolish masters who can never satisfy our desires, our real desires. Instead, what do we get? Unhappiness, fear, anxiety, lamentation, and illusion. And what do we say about that? Oh, you know, it's part of life. <laughs> That's the way it is to live, you know, unhappiness, fear, anxiety, lamentation, illusion, and some temporary joys. But just think, for that temporary happiness, a little drop of it, you have to work so hard. But because everyone's doing like that, you think, oh, it's normal. <laughs> to slave night and day for just one drop of material happiness. Everyone's doing like that. <laughs> This is not intelligent discrimination. Oh, how I have uselessly tortured my own soul. I have sold my body to lusty, greedy men who are themselves objects of pity. Thus practicing the most abominable profession of a prostitute, I hope to get money and sex pleasure. So you would say, oh yes, this is abominable that she's done that. But just look and see how we are selling ourselves. We're selling our minds and bodies and intelligence to lusty, greedy persons who are running the business world. Yeah, we're selling ourselves. Of course, everyone has to maintain their family. But if you don't have a higher purpose for your family, then indeed you've sold yourself to lusty, greedy men and women who are the business moguls, the employers. And like Pingala, standing at the doorway, advertising yourself. Similarly, uh, from the material point of view, when we go to get a job, we're advertising ourselves, yes? At the interview, you show your attractive form. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can do this. I can do that. I'll satisfy you. Oh, yes. Whatever needs to be known, I can know it. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> right? <laughs> there should be a higher purpose in life. Our devotees, they go to work, they go to school, but they're not like Pingala. They are doing this, going to work, going to school, in order to be able to give the Krishna conscious lifestyle to themselves and to others. So the devotees don't let their work and study life control them. They just do the necessary for maintaining and save as much time as possible for spiritual development. I think we'll stop here and ask. We'll continue later where we left off. But let's see. Are there any questions? Hopefully we're learning something from Pingala. She's lamenting. What a fool I am, wasting my time. What do you think? Speechless. <laughs> so where do we go from here? Krishna is offering his own instruction how we can revive our spiritual identity, 
how we can give the greatest gift to ourselves, to the family, to the world. Otherwise, we'll lament like Pingala. Maybe in our last session, besides finishing the Pingala Gita, we'll go over the five regrets that uh, doctors and nurses who work in hospitals, taking care of dying people, they have compiled a list of the five main regrets that people express in the hospital before they die. Because we want you to live a truly successful life and leave this world without any regrets. Only the Krishna conscious person can do that. I have used this temporary body to achieve the eternal. Not that I've neglected the body, but I've used it to achieve the highest destination. Because the material body also belongs to Krishna, just like the spiritual energy belongs to Krishna. Recognizing that Krishna is the supreme proprietor, we use everything for his purposes. Whether it's school or a job or whatever. The body. This is how complete the bhakti package is. Just like Arjuna fought the Balakukshetra under direction from Krishna. Similarly, a devotee can work or go to school, have family. The whole point is to have a balanced lifestyle. And that requires guidance and intelligent discrimination. But unless we detach ourselves from a passionate life, we'll never develop that intelligent discrimination. So remember, yesterday we said that even if you want to try for material happiness, there are some things that you need to put in place before you try for material happiness. We'll discuss that this afternoon. No questions? Yeah. Yeah. How to improve our chanting to in like how to enjoy it more and more, the chanting. First we have to recognize that we are in a disease state. And we need to do the necessary work to become healthy. And when we're healthy, our natural taste will be there again. The example given by Rupa Goswami and Sri Padeshamrita, nectar instruction. Sat Krishna Nama Charitari Patopya Vidya. He says, the Hare Krishna mantra, the holy name of Krishna, is sweet like sugar candy. But we have jaundice. And what happens when you have jaundice and you taste something sweet? It's bitter. But the traditional cure for jaundice is to take rock candy. And gradually, as your health returns, you're able to taste the natural sweetness of the rock candy again. So in the beginning, we need to follow the doctor's prescription, recognizing that we are diseased. And gradually, your spiritual taste will come back. Just like maybe in the beginning a child doesn't like to go to school, but gradually the child starts to enjoy learning and getting the top grades. Some of you were like that. When you first went to school, you didn't like it, but then you saw that you could succeed. <laughs> I remember when I was four years old, my mother teaching me, maybe three or four, teaching me how to read. Every time I would read a word or a page of words successfully, she would give me a piece of chewing gum, one stick of chewing gum. I thought, well, this is good. <laughs> Just for saying these words, I get a stick of chewing gum. <laughs> how valuable. <laughs> you know, a package of chewing gum then had five sticks in it, cost five cents. <laughs> Wrigley's chewing gum. <laughs> so every time I would read some words successfully, she would give me one stick. Oh, one stick of chewing gum. 
it's worth one cent. But I thought, that little kid, I thought, wow, this is nice. <laughs> so in that way, gradually, I developed a taste for studying. So if you have good guidance and good association, you'll be stimulated to revive your taste for chanting Hare Krishna. You have to be around persons who will stimulate your appetite. Because right now your appetite is abnormally absent due to sickness. Still, even now, in our disease condition, we can taste some nectar from chanting Hare Krishna, but it's nothing like what is fully available. <laughs> so we need to be around persons who will stimulate our spiritual appetite to be Krishna conscious. And hopefully this weekend, you're getting that experience. If you're around stimulating persons, you'll be stimulated. I remember when I was maybe eight or nine years old, uh, my relatives, aunts, uncles, they would always ask, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be? They were stimulating the kids. Think now, you're eight years old. What is your career? What are you going to be? <laughs> they were stimulating the appetite. Now, what does an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old know about a career? But the parents and the relatives, they're stimulating that appetite. Think, think, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? <laughs> I remember as a nine-year-old, I used to, because the parents were saying like that, I used to read everything. So I used to read the New York Times and even look at the job section. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, especially the fi the financial job, you know, job uh, offers, you know, for investment bankers and brokers and this and that. And I, would, <laughs> I would imagine I was just nine years old. Oh, and security specialist. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then I saw a picture of someone who was a petroleum engineer. And the person had one of those hard hats on, you know? I thought, oh, that's really, that's really cool. So I changed my mind. I want to be a petroleum engineer. <laughs> so I told my mother, I was just eight years old. I said, no, I don't want to be an investment broker anymore. I want to be a petroleum engineer. Immediately, the next day she comes back from the bookstore with a, with a book, you know, meant for children. Your future as a petroleum engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Then later I would change my mind again. Oh, no, no, no. I think I want to be an investment broker. Next day she'd come back from the bookstore, another book for children. Your future as an investment banker. <laughs> <laughs> so this way she's stimulating the appetite. I was just little, I didn't know. <laughs> the parents and relatives, the aunties and uncles, they're hoping he's going to get the taste. He's going to get the taste. <laughs> So she was always telling me, you know, about who's got what job, what career. Oh, did you know that your uncle, you know, he went, he's just finished Wharton School of Finance, and he's getting this job. <laughs> I'm just eight or nine years old, <laughs> but she's trying to get the taste. <laughs> so you have to be around persons who are going to give you that bhakti taste while you're pushing on your material affairs. And then it's so easy to chant Hare Krishna. Otherwise, on your own, what are you going to think? No time, right? Put it off to later, right? Bhakti is when you're, it's for when you're 60 or 70, right? No, bhakti is for now. <laughs> so this art of living a balanced lifestyle is the greatest contribution to the world. How to be Krishna conscious even while you're within the world of matter. That is the greatest science. Anything else? Yes. Thank you very much for taking that interesting topic. Earlier only I thought, but I now, now I know. What topic? The thing like the other. Ah. Earlier I thought that why is this in Bhagavatam? No. <laughs> like, 
earlier I thought that uh, I feel like a prostitute working and everyone's exploiting, but I know that I am. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. Apart from that, uh, the question I wanted to ask is like getting that sort of knowledge and then realizing that yes, this is what one should be doing it. But when you go to the back to the life is normal and then you can't really do what you already know, then that creates a kind of tasso. It's an inner tasso. How do you really overcome that fight within? Now let me be clear. What what's the fight between? On the one hand, there's what? You, one hand, you know that this is what you should be doing. What should you be doing? That you should be devoting most of your time remembering him. And then what's on the other side? That's what you don't do. Uh, you do your job. You do everything. Krishna consciousness, bhakti, is the art of the possible. But we need guidance and good association. Otherwise, we will feel a little lonely and, oh, how am I going to do this? Why has Krishna made it so difficult? It's not true. We simply need to learn the skill. That's why I gave the example of my parents and relatives. They're, they're trying to get the skill. You're eight years old. Uh, you should know that there's such a thing as a career. So they're stimulating the appetite. And then giving guidance from their point of view, coming back with all the shastras, your future as a chemical engineer. <laughs> so you have to be around persons who will give you guidance and stimulate you. Otherwise you're gonna think, oh, it's impossible, the work, the home, this, the that, the other. But in good association, you'll see it's, it can be done. When you see there are so many devotees who have families working, going to school, and they're practicing bhakti nicely. But I can assure you, in nine out of ten cases, in the beginning, they thought it was going to be impossible. <laughs> yes, you can remember thinking that? Yeah. <laughs> so it's nothing new to think, oh, this is going to be too difficult. But if you have good association, guidance, then uh, you'll be able to see the way through. Even you may say, well, I don't have the taste right now. But you can get the taste by good association. I didn't have the taste for a career when I was eight years old. So what would you say? Did my parents and aunties and uncles, did they do the right thing, materially speaking? Yes, you think that's good parenting, right? Yeah, in India, they would say, definitely. Very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> what did I know as an eight-year-old? But the parents said, we know what is best. There is such a taste. And that's what you should try to get. Of course, then I, when I, was, when I finished university, when I was 21, Shiloh Prabhupada came along and said, Here's a much better taste. <laughs> well, that's another thing. <laughs> so you keep good association and get good guidance. You'll be stimulated. You'll realize it is possible. So many times these days I'm hearing when I talk to persons individually, oh, I have this problem, this complexity, oh, there's a school problem, there's a work problem, oh, marriage problem, oh, I don't know what to do, should I marry this one, or should, what? oh, the parents want this, but I want that, and uh, <laughs> I hear this all the time. But in every case, it's possible to be Krishna conscious. Krishna, by his aiming his instructions at Arjuna, has given instruction to everyone in all times and all places. Anything else? Yes. Uh. All right, so we look forward to seeing you this evening for our wrap-up.
we'll finish the Ping de la Gita, see what her realizations are, and where she's going to go from there. Uh, and we'll discuss the prior steps that you need to take if you're going to try to get happiness. Now remember, we already discussed that you don't need to try for happiness, but I can accept that not everyone is convinced. So we'll present a compromise. <laughs> okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate it.